Hi, I'm Bob McCoskery and welcome to Family Matters. Well, the media, sometimes we get a bit worried about them. We think they might be a bit biased. Uh, we're concerned about funding. How should we approach the media? Because they're supposed to be the watchdog, but maybe we need to be a bit more of a watchdog on them. Uh, and I heard a podcast recently by a good friend, Brendan Malone, uh, and he's just started a new podcast, and it is called The Dispatches with Brendan Malone, which seems to be very popular. Uh, and so we'll give you some details about how you can tune into that uh, at the end of this in the details section. But Brendan Malone, welcome to Family Matters. Bob, it's great to be on with you. I love your work. Now, let's uh, get straight into it, because you have come up with 11 things that we need to be aware about when we approach the media, and um, look, I, I can relate to all of them, so let's get straight into it. Uh, number one is headlines. What do you mean by this? Well, what I mean by that is that a headline can be incredibly biased, and why this is so important is that we live in the day and age, the information age, where we're drowning in information constantly uh, being updated and changed and social media throws us at, uh, information at us 100 miles an hour. Uh, not much wisdom, lots of info, uh, but what that means is we tend to actually skim read or often only read a headline. And so if you get a biased headline, then if that's all you read, you will be misinformed or you will be led down one particular direction. And the the interesting thing about all this is that it's, it's really driven by the fact that uh, um, advertising revenue now is click-driven for a lot of media. They need you to click on the article. So you'll see a lot more salacious clickbait type headlines anyway that don't give you the key details in a the story. They want you to click to find out that key detail. But on issues, what you can have is a situation where a journalist might write a really good, fair and balanced article but then the copy editor or whoever is responsible for producing the headline will write a terribly biased headline. And often the more salacious, the better. And so people can be completely misled about an issue or a person or a particular incident, incident or event simply that way. Actually, I've had that example where I've sent an uh, opinion piece and uh, the sub editor basically puts in their own heading for your opinion piece. And sometimes that heading is, yeah, it can completely misrepresent what you are trying to say. Um, in your podcast, you gave a, a, a couple of examples of, uh, of, of statements that people might use, you know, they, you won't believe uh, yeah. kind of heading, isn't it? That, that's designed to get us to, we want to find out more. It doesn't give us the details, does it? No, it's a clickbait. The, 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 really what you're looking for in a headline is, is, is it drawing me in? What, what one particular tech expert in, the, in Silicon Valley referred to as a race to the bottom of the brainstem. And the media is very much engaged in an arms race, I would say, to the bottom of the brainstem right now. They want your animal brain to go, oh, I better click and find out what Bob McCroskery has been doing, Coskery, sorry, has been doing, because I, 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 this headline says you won't believe what Bob's done. Yeah. And so what has he done? I better find out. And so the, the reason why this matters so much is that as I said, in an age where a lot of people just don't read anything more than the headline, and it's apparent if you look on social media and news sites and watch comments that that's all people are doing often, that can be the most dangerous form of bias that a story might contain. Yeah, I, I actually thought, no, that can't be right. People don't have those headings. And then I went and did a bit of research and I found this one, you won't believe where Marcus <laughs> broadcasts from. Yeah. Uh, and then I saw this one, you won't believe the problem kindergarten teacher had with child's food. But, but I think you're right, um, Brendan, because I've, I've talked a little bit uh, about headings uh, where they take a negative statement and try to paint somebody negatively mm -hmm. or they, um, yeah, they, they want to give a person a negative perception. I've got a couple of examples of that. Uh, there's this one, you know, when you see this heading of Shane Jones, I'm no sex fiend, what do you immediately think? You think, uh, yeah, he's a sex fiend. I mean, <laughs> it's the title. Here we are, Peter Dunn, I am not a leaker. Uh, <laughs> Prince Charles, I'm not that stupid. I mean, what do you immediately <laughs> think when Prince Charles says that? Uh, Andrew Little, it is embarrassing. You know, why, why do they put that heading up? Because they want you to click on it because they think it's quite funny and it's a negative perception. Bridges insists that he's not a heartless. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, it can get a little bit subtle. You know, we're not bigots says yeah. the vicar splitting from Anglicans over same-sex blessing. I thought the, the classic example was this one, though. This is Stacey Abrams. She was going to stand for president, but then she decided she would be an excellent running mate. Look at this quote. I'm a really good loser. Um, <laughs> that's, terrible. That, that, that's, a, that's a great heading. One more. Uh, Todd Muller says there are bigger issues to worry about than his gaffes. 
So what do you mean? You want to click on that because you want to see what the gaffes are, don't you? That's right. And, and it's, it's often to look for any headline. Here's another trick you'll see. You, you'll see reporting in New Zealand, for example, about crimes that probably crimes that have a bit more interest. So, for example, sexual offending by teachers in a school. But what they won't tell you in the headline is that the school is an overseas school because they want you to click on it because you're a parent probably or you know someone or maybe you're in that space and you think, oh, I better find out if I'm at risk. Mm-hmm. And so you, you once you start seeing it, you really do recognise that that pattern of, of clickbait headlines and, and salacious headlines are, are sort of everywhere. Yeah, that really frustrates me. I wish they'd put uh, national or international. One other classic I saw just before we leave this one is uh, on the front page of the Dominion Post. They had this heading, unborn baby dies. Mm. Now, well, that's interesting. If, if we're mm. concerned about unborn baby d- uh, dying, then maybe we need to look at some of the laws. Anyway, let's continue. Number two, burying the lead. What do you mean by that? Well, burying the lead, it's a traditional term within journalism where what you do is you actually start a story and then you bury probably some of the most important or the most important information so far down into the story that effectively what you've done is you've coloured the narrative already, you've coloured people's thinking, and by the time they get to the really important fact, often what happens is people drop out. I've seen stories where the actual important fact is not even in the story right until the final paragraph or two, and by that time most people have checked out, they've stopped reading, they've read only the first bit, or they've had their perception coloured by everything else that's gone on beforehand, but that doesn't register with the same impact that it should. So uh, the important details really should be present to a reader or a listener or a viewer up front because they give clarification that often really does uh, change the whole perspective on an issue. So we really need to be discerning in those first couple of paragraphs because that's where the reporters may be trying to influence our thinking, aren't they? Yeah, very much so. And and don't just don't just read a headline. Don't just read uh, even a part of a story. Don't just even read one whole story. Try and I often say check twice. Uh, yeah, check twice. Measure twice. Cut once. So read more than one source. And 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 if you have to go to the original source who's being quoted and see what they actually said. Yeah, that's a must, especially in these days. Okay, number three, uh, leaning one way. Yeah, so basically what this is, you can have, let's say there's a bill before Parliament, it could be any bill. Uh, In my podcast, I use the example of some sort of uh, flag change bill. And let's imagine that what you did was uh, you took a survey of all of the articles or stories run by a media outlet over the entire course of that bill. Do the stories represent a 50-50 balance or do they lean, by the end of it, the majority of the stories have been published, say, 70-30 for one particular outcome? 70-30, that's pretty generous. You've been nice to media. <laughs> I mean, you've, you've really um, pressed a button on me because, as you'll know, with the cannabis referendum, uh, we did an analysis of the coverage of that. Uh, and we looked at you know every media report during that referendum, and what we found was a significant bias in terms of um, whether they were promoting the yes or the no, whether it was entirely yes biased or entirely no biased, even the op-eds were biased as well. So, you know, um, unfortunately, they can't help themselves. To be honest, Brendan, the media coverage around the conversion therapy ban uh, has been woefully biased, and we're going to do an analysis on that. And I think people will be shocked by just how one-sided it has been. But that's that's the way they operate. If they have a view on something, I mean, as we know, some media outlets won't actually let a contraview on now, will they? I think, is it stuff won't let a contraview on the gender issue, a transgender issue or climate change? Well, well, here's the thing. This is People often think of bias and they imagine that you're proposing some nefarious conspiracy theory where all the editors get together on a Monday morning and say, right, who are we going to target this week? Um, that, that's not how it, it's, it's really not how this happens. It's, it's, it's simply the fact that if you are in an echo chamber and you're in a very small sort of group of people, often in the media, it's like a communal environment because they work in very strange hours and it's, it's the demands are huge. And if you're in a small community like that, And you've all got the same political view or the majority of you do, which we know the research shows us they do, and it leans left. Mm -hmm. You're going to start to imagine that your left-leaning views are actually the centre. And so anyone who's even slightly right of centre all of a sudden becomes far right. And so what happens, that bias creeps into your stories, the way you cover issues. You think your view is the normal. You think it's the centre. You think it's the way things should be. And everyone else who disagrees is somehow dangerous and crazy. Mm. Okay, number four, you, what do you mean by the actors? Well, what I mean by that is um, how are the actors in a story uh, introduced to us? 
So um, what I mean by actors, uh, I don't mean people who are acting. I mean the, the people who will be interviewed in a story, who will contribute in some way. You're reading a story or watching a news report. The different people that are interviewed or who are giving uh, some contribution to that, the journalist goes to speak to. How are they introduced? How are they spoken about? Because that will have a huge influence on, on how you view the words that come out of their mouth. If you are already tainted in your view of that person before they've even said their first word, that's going to have a big influence on how you view or whether you even listen to what they have to say. So those adjectives that they use before introducing a person, those are really quite significant. We need to watch those, don't we? Yeah, very much so. So if, if you know, you, you see words that are emotive, I would suggest to you that good journalism is really about avoiding those kinds of like hyperbole and emotive kind of descriptors of certainly of people and events. Um, there are times where it's warranted. You know, you have some tragedy and it's shocking in scale. But generally, if you're talking about a debate around ideas, you shouldn't be seeing sort of hyperbole and emotional extremes being used to introduce or discuss uh, one particular person or other in a story. I think that that's straight away that should be ringing alarm bells about what's actually going on. Okay, now number five, imagery. Uh, imagery is hugely hugely powerful. We remember imagery, the, the two most recognized and remembered forms of communication are stories and images, and images are the most powerful form of storytelling. And it's there's several ways this can work. I've seen stories where you will have a, a really good, even a really good balanced article on an issue or a bill uh, interviewing one particular side, but then before you even get into the meat of the story, there's a photo or a video at the very top from the opposing side that paints them in, in a much stronger light. So, you know, the image often takes over before you've even heard from the opposing view. Another example is where, um, with this is an old trick with photography or filming. If it's a group that's protesting something and you agree with them, and they've only got a small group of protesters turn up, you tighten up that camera angle and you make it nice and close and, and cropped in and you take a photo. So it, it's hard to tell how many people were present. You know, was it thousands? Who knows? Um, if it's a group you don't like or you disagree with, you widen out the camera angle. If they've got a small group, you make it look really big and wide and make them look very small and insignificant. That You can't underestimate the power of an image like that and how that actually works. And so, you know, for example, I, I looked at some examples. I mean, you can either show someone looking not so mm -hmm. good or very smiley, and that immediately paints a, of a picture of what you think they'll be like. You know, mm -hmm. if you want to paint it negatively, you do this photo. If you want it positively, that photo. Uh, if you're trying to roll a leader, you somehow catch them with their, you know, eyes shut. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually um, quite a concern. You actually, um, in your podcast, you talked about some advice you were giving to uh, a, a person who was being interviewed and telling them to smile. Yeah. It's really important, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I, I honestly, this was a such, now you, I always say to people if, uh, when I'm doing media training for them, a smile as long as it's appropriate to smile. If it's not appropriate, you know, you don't want to be talking about some natural disaster and smiling away through it. That would be a bit weird. People think you're a psychopath. But, it, but in most cases, it is appropriate to smile. In this particular situation, um, a journalist was there to write a story and there was a photographer. And they wanted to effectively recreate a scene that had happened. And it was on a campus. And I said to this uh, lovely young lady before she went into the, in the media interview, I said, smile, whatever you do, smile. And no matter what happens, just smile for the photograph. And sure enough, three different occasions the photo was taken. And each time the photographer tried to get her to stop smiling and to take a more serious tone when she was recreating this event. And thankfully, she remembered the advice and she didn't. And so the final image that ended up being used in the story was this really beautiful, smiling young lady who represented a more accurate and authentic representation of the people in their views. The stern school mom type look was what they were going for. That's what they were trying to find. Yeah. And so you really can't, like those examples you've cited are, are, are just so classic. I, I've got to the point now where I, I will know which way a story will be in tone just by seeing the image, often, for example, of Jacinda Ardern. If, if it's a really positive image, I know it's probably going to be positive. I see a negative image of her. I know that they're probably taking a more attack-based stance on whatever she's saying, and it really generally tends to be quite consistent like that. Well, let me give you an example of this because I talked about the coverage of the conversion therapy issue, uh, and this is, this is in stuff. And so this is an article which is talking about the record number of submissions. And let's just scroll down this article. So I've just taken some screenshots. So at the top, we've got a positive 
you know, story of someone who desperately wants to ban conversion therapy. Then we've got the Greens promoting uh, their petition with the number of signatures that have never been verified. So there's two positives. And then the next photo down is this video produced by Radio New Zealand uh, talking about why we need to ban it. And then the next photo down is the key supporter of the conversion therapy. And then the next photo down is the key supporter in dress. And then the next photo down is another key supporter. And then the next photo down is the chair of the committee who has shown that she's fully supporting the bill and voted for it. And then you've got the minister who is promoting eight images all going in one direction. That's pretty disturbing, isn't it? Well, it is. And I, I, I've actually seen even worse. Like I, you worse? talked about... Well, you talked about you talked about the media coverage of of um of the conversion therapy bill. Uh, the first day that bill arrived in Parliament, uh, the New Zealand Herald had a social media post with the whole graphic they'd drawn up with a heart and a rainbow and and a status to go along with. They were referring to any opposition as hate filled bigotry. It's got no place in New Zealand. I couldn't believe that a media outlet before that even started reporting properly on the issue. That's what they chose to launch with, and the imagery was all designed to manipulate in one direction. Hmm. Well, maybe we won't be surprised after our little discussion today. Let's move on to number six, opposing voices. This is uh, the first point you made about opposing voices. Yeah, so what you have is if look for the whether or not there's actually opposition voices, if there's dissent in a story. Now, sometimes that's not possible. So let's say, Bob, you put out a press release on an issue, and so you're breaking the news. You're not responding to something. You're breaking some new piece of research. Mm. It's quite conceivable there might be a story that initially appears where they go and interview Bob, and you don't hear from anyone else initially. But then what you would expect is over the next few hours or days, there would be uh, other voices and other stories that are responding to that. So that can happen. But generally speaking, there should be at least two voices, possibly sometimes more, in a particular story. And particularly the bigger the issue, the bigger the bill, the bigger the event, whatever it is that's actually being discussed, it's really the more important it is to have those voices and to hear those views. And so if you've got a story where you've only got one side being presented, straight away, you need to go and make sure that you hear other sides of, of a particular issue. Well, actual example of this in the media cannabis uh, um, coverage, we found that um, 62% of the news articles did not quote. I mean, that's two out wow. of every three articles did not quote someone from our side. Wow. So that's just how bad it can be. So we need to watch out. Number seven was opposing voices, What the second version of this. Well, here's a little fun story for you is because it's, um, the, the, the whole point with this point number seven was that there is an imbalance in the opposing voices. So you don't just assume because you've got <clears throat> two voices in a story that you've got balance. What you can have is I'll give you a great example of how this can work is you can have a situation. Let's say it's the euthanasia bill and you have a, a, a pro euthanasia campaigner or voice who's interviewed first. And then you have an anti euthanasia voice and then they go back and they interview the pro. The, the pro again and then they end the story. Now, what's happened there is this. Brilliant. You haven't got balance and you've been led on a journey. You've started with pro-euthanasia. You've ended with pro-euthanasia. That's what's happened there. So there should be a, 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 a like-for-like balance throughout a story. Um, here's an interesting, fun little fact. A couple of years ago, I remember reading um, some independent analysis that had been done of election coverage in the U.S., and Fox News is often accused of being this right-wing media outlet and, and how biased and terrible they are. And they don't hide their bias. They are. They're right-wing. They don't, but here's the thing. When they analysed election coverage of the various networks, it was consistently found that Fox was actually the most balanced because what they did was, even though they didn't hide their political leanings, they gave equal airtime to people from the other side, whereas the other networks hid their leanings, and they didn't give equal airtime to people on the other side of issues. So that balance is actually really, really important. Yeah, and I think that's a bit that bugs me is that, you know, look, they may have a bias, but at least um, act fairly. I think they've sort of almost got past this point of even trying to act fairly, and they're being quite blunt about it. Number eight, uh, this is uh, uh, interesting. This is psychological priming. Yeah, well, this is really important. You, you, you probably don't realize this, but before you, I talked about a, a version of this earlier, the presentation of an actor in a story, mm. the, the words that are used to describe them, the way they are couched, uh, all of that is really priming you psychologically to think about a person. But there are, you can, the same can be true of events and issues, and it, it can be as simple as one word. I, I'll, I'll give you an example. The word rumor and the word allegation are often exactly the same thing. In fact, very commonly the same thing. 
If you use the word rumour, though, what do you think of? You think, oh, false stories being circulated by gossips. That's what you tend to think or associate it with. You're psychologically being primed to think that way. If you hear the word allegation, however, that sounds a bit more legal, a bit more formal. It sounds like something that needs to be tested properly. Uh, you know, straight away, generally, there's a, it's, it's really that simple. Word association is a very powerful form of psychological priming. And it's really it's often stories, you start to see that priming um, running through stories. And, and we see a lot of, particularly in the current pandemic, there's lots of that sort of priming going on. You'll see, for example, it's not uncommon to see stories where the word vaccine has the word safe in front of it constantly. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. But what I'm saying is you're being primed to think a certain way by the way the, 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 uh, the data is presented to you. Okay, you're preaching to the converted. On <laughs> I mean, I can I can show you a few examples of this. Uh, you know, during the same-sex marriage debate, you know, we weren't pro-marriage; we were anti. So it was always yeah. the the word anti. I don't know if you can see that just up in the top, but the actual URL that they had on the original story was homophobic website. Wow. <laughs> so they're already labeling. the URL. The URL <laughs> can I say to that that URL doesn't lie? The way you get that. As you type that in the headline of the story, and the URL grabs that as as the the, yeah. the so that's what they originally they were market, they were playing around with. So it's pretty clear what they were thinking. But I, yeah. I, I um, after listening and preparing for this, I thought I'd just go and check out what some of the um, psychological priming they're doing in a story about family first. And so we found that they were a conservative lobby group. Um, sometimes they're a Christian lobby group. Uh, if they really don't like us, we become a right wing lobby group. Uh, and then we become a conservative Christian <laughs> lobby group. Uh, and then there was this, this uh, phrase when we uh, were in court about the deregistration. It said, advocacy group, Family First, has lost its appeal to have its charitable status reinstated. The controversial group <laughs> whose objectives <laughs> include opposing abortion, euthanasia and same-sex marriage. I mean, that is just shocking, isn't it? That I mean, I haven't seen pro um, abortion groups, pro euthanasia or pro same sex marriage groups called controversial. So that's a very oh, loaded term, isn't it? Oh, that, that statement there is huge. That's a great example of psychological priming. And, and it's very, very powerful. It's effectively, it's beware of this boogeyman. Now, let's hear from the boogeyman. What do you have to say? And, and I'll give you a great example in the abortion debate is you hear pro life groups being referred to as anti choice groups. Mm. Um, now, anti-abortion is fine because that's an accurate representation, but, but to call them anti-choice, that carries a lot of psychological currency because in an age of radical individualism where choice is held up as king or queen, I guess, depending on which way you look at it, then, then to have someone who's anti-choice, oh my gosh, they're a threat to me and my autonomy straight away. So it's very loaded, that phrase. Yeah, the other example was um, the book Into the River when we applied for it to be rescheduled because, or you know, to have an age restriction because of the content that was in it. Uh, and so it was banned because under the law it had to be reassessed as to whether it should have been R14 because of its uh, offensive content. Now, what they did was they reported about this decision and they talked about the president of the Film and Literature Board Review, which is Don Matheson, QC, and they said that he issued the interim order. You know, So he followed the law. He did exactly what the law said he needed to do. They've actually amended the law since that just to deal with an anomaly. But here's the key. Look what they said here. Matheson an active Christian earlier argued for the book to receive an R18 yep. restriction. Yep. Now you gave an example of that also with Sir Bill English. Yeah. So before I talk about that, Bill English, if you go back to that headline you just showed there, there's another example in that. And that is the word racy. It's actually, I've seen the content. It was pornographic. Yeah. Racy implies that it's sort of some sort of low level, salacious, lewd sort of words here and there and descriptions, but the content was pornographic yeah. and very pornographic. So you, that's another example of a form of psychological priming there that's led you astray. Now, Bill English, it was very common whenever there were issues like, say, abortion and euthanasia on the table, all of a sudden he went from being Bill English or leader of the opposition or you know whatever his role he was at the time, all of a sudden he became Catholic. Bill English or Catholic leader of the opposition or Catholic PM or Catholic, whatever the role was he had, Catholic was stuck in front. Why? Because it's priming you to think, oh, his views on these issues are somehow tainted or not as reliable because, hey, haven't we all agreed we're going to exclude religious and conservative voices from the public square? So don't listen to him. Mm. That, that um, choice of words is really important. Even the mm. other side of the debate has realized that I saw with NARAL, which is one of the biggest uh, pro-abortion groups in the States, 
Um, this is a progression of their names. They were the Association to Repeal Abortion Laws and the National Association for Repeal of Abortion Laws. That's where you got NARAL from. National Abortion Rights Action League, National Abortion Reproductive Rights Action League. But what they realized was that the word abortion was problematic. It was too specific. It was too honest and it was too ugly. And mm. so now it's just pro-choice America. Now yeah. that's going back to your, your choice of words is so key, isn't it? The positive connotation. Well, it's supposed to be the pro connotation. Well, here's the thing too. A lot of people don't, this is why, whether it's the hate speech issue or any, any sort of laws around words are really important. People think, oh, they're just words. But words are actually really, really, really important. They're about world building because what we say shapes what we believe and what we believe shapes how we act. And, and in a culture, your words are the actual currency that will either build or pull down a culture. And so that, that is so important. And that's a great example of that, how you, you are, you're, that's the beginning. People often talk about social engineering. It always has to begin with verbal engineering, and that's a great example of verbal engineering to hide the true reality of what's actually going on. Yeah, so we need to be aware of that in the media. Number nine is editorializing. So this happens in a story. Now, if you're reading an editorial, there should be editorializing going on where people are sharing their opinions. But what you shouldn't see is editorializing happen in a story that's supposed to be just reporting on an issue. And it can be a sentence or two. The whole thing doesn't have to be crowded out with it. It could be just a sentence where you're not just told relevant facts uh, uh, about an issue. You, the, the person who's writing the story actually inserts their own commentary around the facts or couches the facts in a form of commentary that's going beyond just telling you the important details that you actually need to know. And it's a very, very common issue. I know some might argue this is foreign to us today, but once upon a time, there wasn't a byline on a story. So you didn't actually know the name of the journalist who even wrote your story. And so now though, we not only do we see the journalist's name at the top of every story, but journalists, as you've proven recently, Bob, uh, with your eye on the 1pm press conference, have actually become celebrities in their own right. And and there's, I think there's a great danger in that. So the tendency is that uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an encouragement and an incentivizing of them editorializing and confusing the role uh, between reporting of the facts in the most uh, balanced way possible and couching those facts in your own personal views and feelings about an issue. Yeah, when we released that uh, cannabis report on the media coverage, I had an interview with Mike Hosking on Newstalk ZB. And, um, you know, one point that he really agreed with was I said that the, the news, the media should be reporting the debate not leading the debate. Hmm. Uh, and even he expresses concerns about that. Um, well, that's interesting. News Talk ZB, one of their bylines, one of their ads is News Talk ZB setting the news agenda. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's this kind of acknowledgement that they, they are setting the agenda of what is news for us and what we should see as news. There was a very, uh, one other funny example is this one, Katie Bradford, uh, during a, an election 2014, she said, you know, no matter what we talk about, no matter what we do, the polls don't seem to be shifting at all, you know, and somehow they were failing to influence our vote. And But that is a widespread view that, that it seems like media are not there to report. They're actually there to influence and change our view. That's concerning, isn't it? Well, well I think what you've got here is a, is a historical thing that's really, I think in a big way, this is uh, post-Nixon uh, uh, and Watergate, you know, where you have these journalists who suddenly elevate the role of journalists. And around that time also, there's the, the sense of journalists as activists are there to actually shape and remake the world. And you can actually trace this with very much this, what some call cultural Marxism. Uh, there's different names for it, but the postmodern thought. And one of the things a lot of people don't realize was that the very original founders of the critical theory school, they actually saw and believed in the importance of mass media as a way of reshaping cultural thought. And so you see that very much in the media. They very much, a lot of them uh, who are involved, see themselves as helping to build a brave new world or a better world for people. Okay, number uh, 10 is irrelevant stuff. You're not talking about the whole thing, are you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not talking about stuff there. So no one please come and lynch me for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm saying what you get is the inf introduction of irrelevant information or facts. So I, I, a great example would be if, if they're covering an issue, Bob, say let's say there's a bill that you've uh, spoken up and you're lobbying on and you're campaigning about. And then what happens is that all of a sudden 
you, you get information about you or something else that you're involved in 10 years ago that's got absolutely nothing to do. Now, if it's relevant, it's relevant, right? You want, you know, you need to know the details, but often it's not relevant. And the reason that information is included is to actually try and discredit you or say, okay, well, this person was unpopular on a previous stance they took. Mm. Let's bring that up again now on this brand new, totally different stance. It's totally irrelevant to it, but you know, it colors people's perception of the person and what they're saying. Mm. Okay, and uh, finally, full disclosure, number 11. Yeah, and this is the failure to disclose, to disclose relevant facts or information. So um, the example I used in my podcast was I was trying to be as neutral as possible. So let, let's imagine a situation in which your country is having a, a referendum on, on flag change. And what is not disclosed throughout the whole entire time is that, uh, you know, one of the key organisations or people involved in advocating for change also happens to be the owner of a multinational, I don't know, uh, flag manufacturing company. And so they stand to make a lot of money out of that. That's really important information that should be disclosed. And so the failure to disclose relevant facts uh, can actually leave people, it really is sort of a misinformation. They don't understand, they don't have a full picture and that doesn't help them to sort of discern properly. If they know more information, they can discern, okay, I'd probably need to be a little bit more cautious about the information that person's giving me because their motives might well be affected by this particular fact here that has, you know, that in this case hasn't been told to me. Mm. Fantastic. Okay, let's just sum this up. And um, I think what the concern is, is that, and this is a survey out of AUT at the beginning of this year, is that, like, if you look at that left bubble, mm. uh, less than half of us trust the news overall. Yeah. And even the stuff that you use, it only increases to 55%. It's, it's, the trust level has really plummeted, hasn't it? Well, well, that's the thing I find most shocking. I've talked to groups about this before, um, that, that, that survey where they said, look, they ask people, well, what about the, the news services that you use? And they still, there's this high lack of trust. Mm. That is astounding. And, and what's even more astounding is that they actually discovered that more of us trust politicians in that data than we do the media. And, you know, politicians, the mm. old joke is, you know, that you can tell a politician is lying because their lips are moving and they're considered more trustworthy than the media. What, what really concerns me, Bob, and all this is that, that, that there doesn't seem to be too many people in the media, apart from probably one or two good journalists I know independently, but there doesn't seem to be the, the leaders in this space who are saying, we've got a problem here and we need to actually get to the bottom of why this problem exists. You can't blame the public for it and you can't blame conspiracy theorists. You've actually got to say there is a lack of trust here. Why has this happened? What can we do to change that? Now, I think the, the other graph that was fascinating in that report was that people were extremely concerned that facts were being spun or twisted to suit a particular agenda. So it wasn't only that they were biased about it, but they were being spun or twisted. And people don't like that, do they? No. And, and you, it's also very dangerous because this is really such a dangerous game. And I think we're seeing this now in the midst of a pandemic. This pandemic came hot on the heels of a period of several years where the media completely blew out all its trust, public trust, with the way it covered the American presidency. And it doesn't matter what you think about Trump. The fact is the media set itself up as the opposition party. They reported hoaxes, several of them. Uh, the latest one just a month ago was the fact that the FBI has now come out, or insiders have come out in the FBI and said, there is no evidence that the January 6th um, attacks at, at, uh, in, on Wa in Washington were actually coordinated by, by anybody. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you, you can see what's happened is now we're in a pandemic where you really need that trust, but the trust was already destroyed. And there's a real dangerous effect with the lack of trust in what is supposed to be a, a trustworthy and, as Edmund Burke would say, the fourth estate that's supposed to provide some accountability. Brendan, that's, that's really helpful. I think, look, just to sum it up, um, we need to start using a bit more discernment. We need to, I, th I think your point about verifying is really important. I often get sent stories and I delve into them and just look for some sort of backup, check the source mm. documents, check the reliability of the um, organisation that's reporting it, what's been their reputation. Uh, that, that is so important to delve to delve deeply because I think, um, you know, my, my final point for you is that I want to leave with our viewers is that our click counts, mm. that when we click on a story, in effect, what we've done is we've just given money to the media organisation to do more of that. Yep. And, yeah, exactly. And so exactly. we need to think about whether we click on it or not. If we think it's going to be misleading, if we think that it's already going to have bias and it's not going to add to our base of understanding and factual knowledge, then we should avoid clicking, shouldn't we? 
Yeah, and I think too, here's, here's a little golden, golden rule. There's a couple, and one I've mentioned earlier is, is always measure twice, cut once, you know? So, you know, don't don't cut, go rushing off to cut an opinion and telling the world about something until you've actually verified that it's accurate. Mm-hmm. And number two is this, that if a story sounds too good to be true, well, the, the old adage is it probably is. Mm-hmm. So if you read a story about your political opponents and you think, oh, I knew it, <laughs> straight away I'd go, okay, I need to verify this because if something seems, you know, like, really out there and just too good to be true, quote unquote, the chances are you're not getting the whole picture. So it's important to verify. So it's time for us to be a watchdog on the media. Brendan, really appreciate your time and your insight. And uh, we'll encourage people to go and check out uh, the dispatches with Brendan Malone, which is available on all those platforms. And you've been covering some really important issues. And that comes out, does that come out weekly or... Yeah, we, we, we actually produce sort of two or three episodes a week. So we're doing our best to sort of maintain that commentary uh, as much as we can to give people a, a voice and a, and a, we're trying to what we're trying to do, Bob, really is also pr- provide a a more intelligent uh, and really sort of Judeo-Christian natural law ethic, a very conservative voice that that is is trying to calmly reason and, and consider through issues that hit the news. Well, as we've seen, we certainly need that balance uh, in New Zealand. So thank you, Brendan. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it.